to National Fisherman Live. I'm Leslie Taylor. This week on our program, Michael Crowley, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor, talks about the stern safety suit, and we take a look at how oil spills hurt tuna hearts. But first, some fishing news from around the coasts. Alaska seafood is free of radiation, according to testimony from the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation to the Senate Resources Committee at a recent hearing. Since Japan's 2011 tsunami and Fukushima nuclear reactor disaster, there have been fears that Pacific seafood has been contaminated with radiation. However, DEC Commissioner Larry Hartig said programs are testing fish that swim between the Gulf of Alaska, the West Coast, and Japan, and they have come up with a clean bill of health. The EPA, the FDA, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and Pacific states, including Hawaii, California, Oregon, and Washington, as well as Health Canada, all have demonstrated there are no levels of radiation that are of a public health concern, said Marty Brewer, director of DEC's Environmental Health Division. Thanks to the drought, California's young coho salmon are in danger of not making it to the sea. On California's north and central coast, the drought has parched dozens of streams, dropping water levels so much that the salmon's migratory journey has been obstructed. Right now, young coho in the state are stuck in pools and are cut off from the sea. Stafford Lair, Chief of Fisheries for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, told the LA Times. And the central coast population of coho is endangered, with the population dropping from about 56,000 in the 60s to fewer than 500 returning adults in 2009. Over the last several years, it has hovered around a few thousand, according to estimates from the National Marine Fisheries Service. In a creek near Santa Cruz, there's a hatchery operated by the nonprofit Monterey Bay Salmon and Trout Project, in which some 41,000 coho salmon, just over a year old, are being raised to be released this spring. But unless there is more rain to rise the creek, the young fish have no path to the Pacific. Wildlife officials overseeing the hatchery are considering drastic measures, such as bulldozing a channel or releasing the fish directly into the ocean, the LA Times reports. Coho are the fish that are really in trouble in this state right now, said Lair. Jerry Fraser, publisher of National Fisherman, says droughts like this one remind us how vulnerable farmers and fishermen can be to the vagaries of the weather. Fishermen, like farmers and others, are hostage to the weather uh, and hostage to other environmental factors that they may or may not have any control over. Um, in particular, in California, I think drought is something that's essentially uh, the history of the state. One of the things that this kind of calls to my mind is, is the role of government. And I know often uh, uh, fishermen are, are skeptical or cynical about government, but this is, this is an example where, where government really has the opportunity to, to step up to the plate and shine. And I don't know that government has a solution, but certainly no one else does. And if, if we need to get water down through these rivers somehow, it seems to me if, if it doesn't rain, uh, which is Mother Nature's involvement, then somehow government is going to have to step in and figure out some way, whether it's digging ditches or coming up with some method of irrigation to help fishermen and, I suppose, in the bargain, farmers both see these salmon begin to move along these rivers. Swordfish are back. After overfishing in the 80s and 90s destroyed the surf swordfish population, the stock has since been fully rebuilt thanks to domestic and international conservation measures. As a result, NOAA Fisheries Highly Migratory Species Division recently created a new open access commercial swordfish fishery in federal waters to provide additional commercial swordfish harvest opportunities using gears that minimize bycatch. This move has been echoed by state regulators with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, who this month changed state rules to allow fishermen who participate in this new commercial fishery to land and sell their catch in Florida. Commercial fishermen can now catch and sell three swordfish per vessel per trip within the three mile distance from shore that Florida governs. And fishermen are allowed to now bring in smaller swordfish. The minimum claythrum to keel limit has been changed from 29 to 25 inches. Also in Florida, as the state is easing restrictions on swordfish harvest, they are considering tightening restrictions on sea cucumber harvesting. The rubbery and slimy sea cucumber is viewed as a delicacy in Asia, and there is a growing overseas market for the sea slug. The Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission Board will vote this week on a proposal to limit the daily commercial harvest of sea cucumbers to 200 per vessel per day, according to spokeswoman Amanda Naley. Sea cucumbers are sedentary marine invertebrates that live in shallow water areas such as seagrass beds, lagoons, and nearshore reefs. 
They are vulnerable to overfishing because of their visible and sedentary nature, which makes them easy to locate and collect, the Fish and Wildlife Commission said. Florida Sea Cucumber Corporation owner Eric Lee told the Florida Keys News that the new limit would run him out of business. He pays fishermen 50 cents to a dollar per cucumber, and the daily limit would barely allow the fishermen to cover their fuel bills and other costs. Although Massachusetts ground fishermen land 70% of the catch in New England, the state doesn't have an identifiable brand in the seafood market in the way that Maine has its lobsters or Maryland its blue crabs. Now, a bill before the legislature filed by State Senator Bruce Tarr would brand Massachusetts landed fish along the lines of the U.S. Department of Agriculture Buy Local campaign. The goal is to increase the public's awareness that Massachusetts caught fish are a high quality, sustainably fished product and also to promote alternative species such as monkfish, South Coast Today reports. The new marketing plan would mainly be paid for with a portion of the permit payments collected by the state for commercial fishermen and dealers. So next time you buy scallops, will you be asking for New Bedford scallops by name? And now, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor, Michael Crowley, with product news. I'm Michael Crowley, National Fisherman's Boats and Gear Editor. And this morning, we are at Seattle's Pacific Marine Expo and at the Stearns booth with Stearns' Dana Webb. And as any fisherman knows, when things go to hell in a big hurry, the boat starts to go down, your best chances of survival are having an emergence, immersion suit. And there are immersion suits, and then there are others immersion suits. But Stearns at this show is introducing a new immersion suit with features that other suits do not have. But I'll let Dana explain the benefits of the Thermashield 24 Plus. Dana? So Mike, uh, there's a couple differences on this suit that you don't see on other suits in the marketplace. The biggest one is that we have a uh, patented uh, air circulation system that uh, fits in the back of this suit. And what it does is it takes your breath and recirculates the warmth from your breath throughout the whole suit. So your breath is 88 degrees. Uh, you're going to be getting into the 70s through this entire suit. It goes all the way down to the toes. Another uh, great feature about this suit is the removable gloves that you can see here. What this does is allows you to put on the suit when uh, things are starting to go bad on a ship, but you can still operate the ship. You can do the controls. You've got non-slip boots here, um, and you can be prepared to go over. Um, and then when you do go over, slip the gloves on, you're good to go. Uh, nice thing about this uh, cowl here is that uh, you can put your hands in there and you can actually warm them back up. There's a, a valve here as well that circulates your warm breath across your hands. So uh, we're pretty excited about the suit. We've had uh, test subjects in it for over 24 hours. Uh, traditional suit is tested and certified to uh, six hours by the uh, U.S. Coast Guard and UL. Um, so we're pretty excited to bring this new technology to the marketplace. Okay, Dana, thanks very much. And maybe you fishermen out there are looking for a really good suit, ought to check out your stern supplier. Thanks, Mike. Next, a look at how crude oil, like entered the Gulf of Mexico from the BP Deepwater Horizon spill, causes heart damage that can kill tuna. In the spring of 2010, the Deepwater Horizon disaster released over 4 million barrels of crude oil into the Gulf of Mexico. It was the peak spawning time for the Atlantic bluefin tuna, and the spill could have serious consequences for the already reduced population if many of their eggs and larvae, which float near surface waters, were exposed to oil. Previous studies, particularly in the aftermath of the Exxon Valdez spill, have demonstrated that exposure to crude oil can cause a variety of heart problems in developing fish embryos and larvae, including arrhythmia and embryonic heart failure. Yet no one knew exactly how the chemical contaminants were affecting cardiac function. But now NOAA and Stanford researchers who looked at the effects of samples from the Deepwater Horizon spill on living fish heart cells have discovered the mechanism. In the February 14th issue of Science, they report that crude oil blocks the potassium channels that are distributed in heart cell membranes and are responsible for restarting the heart muscle cell contraction cycle after every beat. When these specialized ion channel pores are damaged, the flow of molecules in and out of the heart cells is disrupted, and the time to restart the heart on every beat is increased. This ultimately slows the heartbeat. 
Dr. Barbara Block, a professor of marine sciences at Stanford's Hopkins Marine Station and lead author of the science study, says that when we see these acute effects at the cardiac cell level, it's not surprising that chronic exposure to oil from spills such as the Deepwater Horizon could lead to long-term problems in fish hearts, as have been observed in studies of larval fish development. For more commercial fishing news and analysis, subscribe to National Fisherman Magazine, visit our website at www.nationalfisherman.com, or subscribe to our twice-weekly e-newsletter. For National Fisherman Live, I'm Leslie Taylor.